Today I'm going to share some words about um, why I believe sustainability is important. Uh, thank you all for coming and good morning. Lately we've been hearing the word sustainability. Many people talk about it, but my generations are the ones who are going to take it into action. David Fertis, my mentor from Kana Royale, our partners in development <coughs> with Sustainable Hawaii Youth Leadership Institute, are helping us to turn our, our, our ideas into action. Thanks to David, I learned about sustainability in middle school. He opened my eyes to see the importance of sustainable agriculture for our community. I also discovered the benefits it represents as a business for our whole state and country. I'm also grateful for David to nominating me to serve as a Hawaiian delegate to the Stone Soup Leadership Institute's eighth annual Youth Leadership Summit for Sustainable Development. It was held last June on Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts for island youth from across the country. As I prepared for my presentation at the summit, I discovered how committed my community of North Kohala is to sustainable agriculture and sustainable business. The North Kohala Community Development Program set a goal of producing at least 50% of the food we consume. Before the arrival of foreigners to North Kohala, as long as the other Hawaiian islands, we were 100% sustainable. Our whole population was able to be satisfied by the needs and resources on our islands. Today, we import about 85% of our food, while 80% of the land in North Kohala is zoned for agriculture use. At the summit, I joined with four other youth delegates from our island and made, pre made presentations on different aspects of sustainable initiatives on Hawaii. Sustainable agriculture, architecture, culture, environment, and education. This opportunity was a true blessing. Traveling to Martha's Vineyard and sharing my findings with youth from Martha's Vineyard and Vieques, Puerto Rico, motivated me to share what I learned to my community members and to involve them in our sustainability in action projects. I know this is a big goal, but this is not an impossible one. This youth leadership forum is the first step. This is our chance to present our beliefs and action steps towards creating a more sustainable island. We hope to inspire many more Hawaiian youth to join with us as well as leaders to support our sustainability in action projects. I've taken this very seriously because this is something really important for my future, your future, and our future. This is why I invited people like you to be here to join us on this special occasion. We are here to celebrate the lives of people like Guy Toyama who contributed so much to our island. We're here to join forces to make Hawaii a more sustainable place and to guarantee this paradise for ones after us. This experience, the experience of creating this youth, leadership, this youth leadership forum has changed my life. I've grown so much. For the past few months, I've been learning how to develop public and private partnerships and invite people to sponsor us so we can realize our dreams. I feel so great when I'm able to honor, her, honor Senator Daniel K. Inouye and meet people like Daniel Kako Jr., Mr. Barry Taniguchi, and Monty Richards. I feel inspired to stay focused on our dream. I don't want to stop for even one minute. I'm convinced that initiatives like these need to be replicated in our, in our country and the whole planet. Thank you for coming to our Youth Leadership Forum. Thank you for supporting the youth of Hawaii. Thank you for making the effort to demonstrate that you care about your future and our future. If no one takes a step forward, there'll be no tomorrow. We are the beginning, we are the change, we are the future, we are the hope of humanity. Thank you. Aloha mai kako. Mahalo ya kako no ko haona no mai i kela. Aloha kai yako. Okay, so the title of my project is... Right to your lips on. No kahua o ko kako ma moomeheo. And that means the foundation of our cultures. So first of all, what is cultural sustainability? In my opinion, cultural sustainability is returning to our roots. Um, obviously, we've, as we've heard this morning, cultural sustainability is not a new concept. It's a matter of 
returning to the practices of our ancestors and putting those um, into practice today. So, um, most of what I've learned about culture sustainability is due to my attending this school, Kanoka Aina. And so here we do, we practice project-based learning and we focus on Hawaiian language traditions and perpetuating those, perpetuating those for posterity. So, sustaining your native culture begins with honoring and continuing traditional customs like, first of all, language. So the restoration of Ola Hawaii is probably the most important thing to help us sustain our culture because our people are, um, our culture is based on oratory. So we didn't write anything down. Everything was maintained through chant or through hula and just compositions that we would um, pass down through generations. Our moku how and our histories, everything was oral. So language is a really, really important part of sustaining Hawaiian culture. Um, luckily, in the 1960s and 70s, um, we saw the emergence of a Hawaiian cultural renaissance. So um, things like the Mary Monarch Festival, the restoration of traditional Hawaiian music by artists like Gabi Pahinui, and also the emergence of the Polynesian Voyaging Society as they um, sought to maintain the voyaging tradition of our ancestors. So they um, just used Hawaiian voyaging as a model and um, practice it in modern times. So today, Hawaiian culture, um, although Hawaii is our official language since 1978, is something we're really, really proud of. Um, oratorical revitalization is underway, and there's rising interest in learning and speaking Hawaiian language. Um, today, we have many people who practice traditional agriculture. So in Waipio Valley, we have all of our taro farmers and we have our loikalo. So that's really, really coming back. And so we're hopefully going to be able to feed our families even more than we are today. Um, and also, one of the most important things, in my opinion, is that there's a renewed pride in Hawaii's culture. So even though our economy is really based on tourism, that's how um, that's how many of us make our livelihood. Um, there's a rising interest in incorporating Hawaiian culture and practice into even the tourist industry. So if that's the avenue that we have to take to um, teach people about our culture, then I say by all means. So the products of cultural sustainability are traditional arts and crafts. So like learning how to make kaula or rope, or learning how to thatch a house, as our ancestors did. Um, learning the practices of wayfinding and navigation to, without the use of modern technology, um, restoring our reliance on the loikalo and the malai, so feeding our families from our native soil, um, and also the practice of holistic Hawaiian education through programs like the Ahapuna Leo and Kula Kaipuni, and Nale Nawa, the Native Hawaiian Charter School line. Also, the preservation of cultural sites, so restorative efforts like rebuilding our hail, and also the conservation of native species like our birds and our plants and our fish. So, the sustenance of culture yields a really universal result. Um, it, first of all, it's a return to a Hawaiian way of thinking. So, one of the little Maya that I feel really embodies um, the ideas of sustaining culture in relation to environmental sustainability is which means the land is chief and man is its servant. So as we've heard a lot this morning, um, the importance between man and land is probably the most important thing we have to realize in order to uh, kind of just change our perspective about the idea of sustainability. So Hawaiian culture kind of acts as a basis for shifting cultural responsibility. Sustainability really is gonna begin as a mindset, and it already has, as we've seen today. Um, to draw upon really ingrained knowledge, to amend modern transition, transgression, and enacting our value of ancestral knowledge. So that some of the positive consequences are that we're finding new solutions to modern issues by using our ancestral knowledge. Um, we're <coughs> applying ancient practices in the modern day. So we're, re we're replanting native plants. We're practicing responsible hunting and gathering, only taking as much as we need, which is a really, really Hawaiian um, concept and way of dealing. So as I said, 
um, Hawaii is a culture really, really based on oratory. So my project for my sustainability in action project is to help share um, student voice. And so I'm going to do that through a writing exhibit that is going to incorporate the voices of the students here at Kanokaina and it's going to help share our perspectives. Um, when we go out later, you can see a little preview of that. There's an exhibit um, with some student writing. And so it's them sharing their dreams, which is pretty much what this whole organization encourages. So it's really great to see that. Um, and another piece of it is that that we need to establish scholarships for our new Hawaiian students to, not that there aren't existing funds for new Hawaiian students to go to college, but we just, I feel like we need to expand that base because by educating our Hawaiian students in an academic form, I feel like that's really how we're gonna um, get our students ready for filling those positions today um, here in Hawaii. So they're not gonna have to go to the mainland, they can stay right here at home and learn and um, consequentially give back to the communities right here. So that's um, my vision and mahalo. Hey, in my um, today's presentation, I'm gonna talk about sustainable agriculture and a little bit about sustainable business. Um, Hawaii on sustainability. I'm gonna talk about the past, today, and the future. Um, during the past, before arrival, I mentioned earlier we were 100% sustainable on all islands. Um, we relied on the Ahupua'a Ahu system, is a system of trading between all Hawaiians of the lowlands and highlands and the ocean. And in North Kohala, when Cook arrived, it was estimated 30,000 people on the shores of North Kohala, and, keep it, and they were all self-sustainable. So to, to, um, at today, we import 85% of our food and 80% of Kohala's land is zoned for agriculture use. Um, those numbers are really not good numbers, I say in my way. And another fact is 57% of Hawaii's population is either obese or overweight. Um, this could relate to our lack in healthy foods. And if the ship was to stop coming, we would only have food for about 15 days on these islands, so that's a good fact to think about. And on to the future, the North Kohala Community Development Program aspires to be 50% sustainable in the food we consume. And this, and their, their goal is to promote a community of diversified agriculture. It's not specifically relying, it means to not rely on one food like how we did in the past, which was sugar. We want to be more diverse and have all kinds of foods so we can have our choice and be more well diverse. Um, for sustainable business, a really easy example would be a farmer's market. Um, getting rid of plastic bags is, is taking the steps forward to being sustainable. Just being more, keep the mindset of being local is a really easy way to be sustainable. Um, Kahanayao, the mentorship program that I'm in, which is funded by Partners in Development, um, they focus on teaching teens different aspects of sustainability um, related to Hawaiian, your Hawaiian values. Um, some of the programs are animal husbandry, culinary arts, Hawaiian saddle making, etc. And on to the Sustainable Hawaii Youth Leadership Institute Youth Leadership Forum. This, today this was kind of my idea. I wanted to plan this event and have people come and look at, listen to our ideas, help with suggestions of how we can pursue our ideas and get everyone involved. Um, what this forum does, it brings together uh, our Hawaiian leaders from business, government, and education to meet us youth delegates and hear about all of our exciting projects. Um, each delegate is invited to develop a in sustainability in action plan. Mine is um, agriculture and business, Makana's culture, and Trevor is education. Um, this is our Hawaiian youth's chance to prevent, present our beliefs and action steps towards creating a more sustainable island to um, let our voices be heard, basically. And we hope to inspire many more Hawaiian youth to join up with us as well as leaders to support our inaction plans. So we hope that everyone can help us. We hope we can get more youth to help us and just reach our goals. Thank you. So my project was on sustainable education and 
this quote was something that I found that I thought was really imperative to right now because right now many people call us the energy generation because with the education that we have now um, they think that future job opportunities are going to arrive that deal with sustainability and the importance of that and I came here mainly to talk about um, a resolution that I created so as a part of a conference last year um, I was one of about 600 students in the state that created a resolution. Mine dealt with incorporating sustainability into the science curriculum, so sustainability and clean energy practices. As a, I created that resolution back in October, and that's kind of been my goal ever since it was passing that resolution and getting support for that resolution. And that's why I decided to join Shiley and to learn more about sustainability and exactly what I didn't know before. Because the reason why I crafted it was because I knew little about sustainability before last year around October and I thought more students need to know about it as we do now. And so currently uh, my resolution is at the Legislative Reference Bureau, if any of you know what that is, the LRB, which is a nonpartisan organization that um, helps to draft resolutions and bills and to help the wording to, before it gets passed. And I'm working with um, Representative Danny Kaufman. And so together we are working to try to get letters of support and testimony to try and pass my resolution. And then I just think that sustainable education is very important because that's kind of the link between students now and then the future and trying to learn more. Because if we aren't educated, then we can't do anything in the future and we just need to understand what needs to get done so that we can sustain ourselves. Especially living in Hawaii where we're isolated from the rest of the world and global changes are going on everywhere. That's it. Thank you. We just want to give a brief recap of some of what we talked about in our session and if there's anyone with expertise in Mana'o to continue to support what Trevor's got going with the, um, um, the education sustainability initiative or sustainable education initiative, um, then we greatly appreciate more people coming up and talking afterwards. Um, so a lot of what we talked about there was less on the resolution level, recognizing that there are um, some barriers in trying to get things through on a government and legislation level um, and also with the DOE. So a lot of what came out was how to work with the DOE um, in some of the programs that they have and where opportunities lie within existing programs as well as um, how to maybe partner with other organizations in the community to really start getting kids involved and showing um, there is a demand, there is a need for sustainable education in the classrooms. Um, and so a lot of it was in order to continue to support the resolution, you know, documenting some of the events that they have, um, continuing to do media on it to really show that the students are supportive of it and there's a definite need and want for it in their classrooms. Um, so that was a lot of where the discussions went to. Um, so we got a really, a lot of great information in particular on potential organizations and other people in um, Hawaii who are working on either zero waste curriculums or initiatives in school and those types of other connections, um, which kind of broaden the picture quite a bit from the resolution to the execution of the resolution. Um, but either way, it really helps on getting the overall um, roadmap on how to get things like this done. Because most of the time, it's not just working on one level, but multiple. Um, and so then at the end, we got to connect with um, Uncle Bob Lindsay, who you know, has a lot of good mana on, on actual the legislative level as well. So I think that's a pretty good um, overview. Some of the stuff was the EPA Environmental Education Program with Recycle Hawaii and Frank Pottinger at um, UH Manoa, who is specifically focusing on um, sustainable curriculums in schools. And then um, we talked a little about also um, the CTE program, and that is a program within DOE and how to work with some of the existing programs there to begin to integrate the sustainable education. Even though it's not in the core curriculum, at least we're starting somewhere. <laughs> and then also, you know, the other big thing was the show of force, really showing students um, out there wanting these programs. So I think that's a pretty good recap of what we went over. And 
um, informal education, making not just the curriculum, but the whole school system and the environment that students are in more sustainable and recognizing, oh, there's recycling bins in the classroom and that kind of stuff. It was good. We really veered away from the resolution in a way. I just kind of tackled sustainable education in general. For example, my senior project, I'm creating a garden at my high school. So we kind of went in that path. We talked about um, just school gardens, recycling, just important things that deal with everything else besides sustainable education outside of my resolution. But it was really successful and I got a lot of great ideas that I'm going to go out with. Is there anything you'd like to add about your resolution that you need help for that you'd like to um, ask people for? Your support? Uh, I could use letters of support. I can hand out a letter I have now. But if you guys would like to write a letter of support for my resolution, that would just help me out going into this next legislative session. That would be great. Thank you. We're going to talk mostly about um, increasing scholarships for Native Hawaiian students. But the talk kind of just turned just into a way bigger discussion on um, kind of increasing interest in cultural sustainability in Hawaii. So. So we talked um, with a group, we pretty much covered three solid things, um, funding, uh, local scholarships, and then the people. So some things that we went over, first was funders. How do we get our funders? Where are our funders? Where are they located? Um, and it was mentioned in our group, if we do want to move forward with um, writing legislation, legislation so that our funders do know that Native Hawaiians should be um, should have as many opportunities to scholarships as um, kind of in the same idea as Native Americans on the mainland. Um, how do we move forward with that? And so it's talked about promoting the bigger vision. Why is it that they should fund these Native Hawaiians um, and how will that help? So letting them know what we will achieve, not what can, but what we will achieve. Um, and also we talked about where do we put our efforts then? Um, Aside from funding, aside from scholarships, I think it's just as important to make sure we collect an inventory. I think it's way in the back. <laughs> um, there we go. There we, go. <laughs> we had a lot of really, really great ideas. Um, creating an inventory. Creating an inventory of who already has scholarships available, who are our funders available, um, and what groups and clubs and people are already doing this work so that way we so that way we do not have to recreate the will. How do we bring all of these people to the table and entrench it into our communities? Some ideas were um, uh, after school programs or community programs so that way middle school and high school youth learn these values, learn these cultures, learn the culture and then go back to the elementary schools and the preschools and as mentors provide this knowledge so that way so that, way that torch does stay passed. Um, so funding and who we can put our efforts into, and then also a, a go back home project or um, program. How do we get the youth who do grow up here and do hold these values so true um, back home after they go to the mainland or after they go to wherever in the world to explore? How do we get them back here? Um, so through programming, um, and staying in contact with high school alumni, and also by providing jobs. Um, local businesses and the tourist industry, um, if we could put, uh, put pressure on them, put effort on them to make internships available, to make um, cultural awareness more present in their practices, um, we felt like it would it'd really help with contributing to the sustainability of the Hawaiian culture. So basically three main themes, in, um, funding and the people and bringing, bringing people back, bringing people back home. Um, we talked about Job Shadow Day and how we, have, we can have a lot of the people that were in our, um, in our group, um, how they can help with, Job Shadow Day, help with Job Shadow Day or suggest um, ways to um, make it happen. And then we also talked about the Youth Leadership Summit nomination process which um, we are always looking for new candidates. And, <laughs> and this is just a lot of information. Of what, what, we did like an introduction of every person and they, gave, they talked about all kinds of stuff. So for example, David, he, he runs a mentorship. And then we talked about sustainable, sustainability and economy. And not a lot of people know how to, not a lot of, not a lot of businesses know how to 
um, mentor students or have a job shadow day and we need to give them like be really specific on what we want them to teach the kids like amount of time um, how often and what the student wants to know and we talked about rotary like how we can partner with them with gaining students or helping them gain students uh, we are very pleased to be the host of the 2013 uh, Sustainable Hawaii Youth Leadership Initiative Forum. Um, we are looking forward along with you to hearing from our youth about their initiatives regarding sustainability. Um, my name is Betsy Bolin. I'm the advisor to Makana Tavares, um, who you'll hear from today. She'll be speaking about cultural sustainability and its benefit to environmental sustainability. Very important topic, we think. Um, Makana has been a student at Kanu Ka'aina New Century Public Charter School for many years. Um, most of those years she spent actually in the outdoors, um, in the bare environment that her project is seeking to protect. And it's only recently that our school is located here in these beautiful buildings um, that we hope we'll get a chance to tell you more about today. Um, briefly, this building that we're in is Halau Ho'olako, and it's the first building of what was envisioned to be an entire kauhale. Um, which is a group of hale that's going to be um, eventually, what we hope, um, will be an entire learning community um, called Kauhale o Pukapu o Iwi. And this vision is that there will be womb to tomb learning here in our community. So all the way from our little babies up to our kupuna will be able to take advantage of learning here. Um, Makana School is housed right next door. It's known as Kanu. And um, it's one of several of Kalo, Kano Ko'aina Learning Ohana's partners. So that's, we're a sister to this Kalo um, nonprofit. Um, as our nominee to the Shiley Summit on Martha's Vineyard, Makana's made us very proud. Um, and we really want to thank the Stone Soup, um, Soup Institute very much for their support of her ongoing project. It's been really um, a blessing for her. Mahalo. Great pleasure to be here this morning with all of you. Thank you, Marianne. And uh, to Nani, I really appreciate uh, what you are sharing. And I, hey, there you are. Now, mm -hmm. um, I guess your name today is going to be called Kaneala. Uh, Daniel. <laughs> we gave you the name Kaneala. And, uh, and I really uh, appreciate sharing of your manao with us about your life. Um, your trials and tribulation and your journey. I think it has a lot of strong messages because uh, as I sat back there, I can relate to much of those steps as an as a individual and as a Hawaiian, but it certainly gives a lot of hope for all of us to go forward in the future. And it's our kuleana, it's our responsibility to share that messages. We have to walk that path for a certain reason. And that information is not for you, for any of us to keep, but to share. I think to, uh, uh, you know, I, I have a mentor too. We all have mentors. And, and King, you, you shared a lot of great things about your mentor, uh, David, there. And uh, uh, I spend time with him and, and we talk about the issues of our community, whether it's sustainability whether it's about um, giving more opportunities for our youth and our community. Uh, we, you know, there's so much that people give, and for him to give you and, and support you, uh, it's a great, great honor to have somebody take you under his, his wings and to share his mana'o. You know, on behalf of Mayor Kinoy, we really, again, appreciate all what uh, Marianne and the youth are doing. As we know, a lot of us know the mayor, one of his very strong points is his love for children, the opio, and his love for the kupuna, the seniors, the elders in our community. And I share the same thing with him. Um, my love for the children, because as, and, uh, even though it's, you know, you hear this all the time, that's our future. They are our future. They are our future. And we got to assure them that we provide the kind of environment that they can feel proud of, that we can pass that baton to them where they can carry on. Um, 
for the next seven generations to come. When I was growing up, we never really talked about sustainability. But when I look back now, I think my parents, my grandparents, my uncles, my aunties, our neighbors, we had to do sustainability. We didn't talk about it. What does it mean? It was there. It was part of our life. It was part of our culture. And as I was journeying along and listening, I grew up on a plantation on Oahu. And so, you know, the first thing I remember, I guess, talking about sustainability is you always made do with whatever you had. You never threw anything away, pretty much. And I remember after we had dinner or any kind of meal, we always, whatever the scrap was, we put them in the, you know, the bowl or the, or the pail. And that, all the scraps went to either feed the dogs or the pigs. So nothing went to waste. There was no uh, garbage disposal. Everything was, was made to be used for a purpose. Along my journey, I had an opportunity to sit down and got to really know a kupuna. And she has since gone home to the ancestors. And some of us in here knew of her. Her name was Auntie Elizabeth, uh, Auntie Malia Craver. And I remember one day sitting down with Auntie, with some of us, and she would share with us a concept of lokahi. Lokahi, to be in harmony and in balance. And she had this triangle. And on top of the triangle was keakua, the goddess. And on one side was mankind, naka naka. And the other side was nature, environment. And arrows was pointing all to each other. And around it she had a circle. And what basically she was trying to share, and at least what I took away with her, is that each one is so very important to each other. Mankind is very important to nature, to its environment. And environment is so critical to mankind. But we cannot forget, as Kaniyala had talked about, the spiritualness of everything. Keakua, and that's why she put that circle around the whole thing. So that Akahi was not only necessarily about harmony and balance, but it was about spiritual harmony and balance between man and nature. And that's always a journey that we have to walk on. It's not an easy thing. It's a work in progress to stay in harmony and stay in balance along the way. We gotta do the Pono thing, but we have to do it the Pono way. When we make decisions about what we're gonna do to better our community as we move forward, questions that we have to ask is, are we in lokahi with each other? Are we in harmony, in balance between man and nature? Are we doing the Pono thing the Pono way. So, as I go forward in my life, I always try to think of those things that I've learned along the way. I have the great privilege and pleasure to work at the West Hawaii Civic Center. And for some of you, I know you have visited the center. For others that haven't, please come and see it. It's a great building, but it's more than a building for me. It's a new way of life almost that we that work in, work at the build, work at that place, we that come to do business at that place, it's a way of looking at things differently. For example, remember I was telling you we when I was growing up we used to put our scrap in the in the slot can. Well there at the at the West Hawaii Civic Center we have white pails so that whatever scrap we have left over after we eat our meals or whatever, 
we put it in this white pail. And all of that, along with all of the separated cans, papers, and everything, are picked up at the, at the night's end, when the day end, and they're sorted, and the scraps are put into the compost bin to be recycled and reused. We're so proud at the Civic Center that almost 175 of us employees there are very much engaged in doing our little part in taking care of Mother Earth along the way. That when we do go about and do an audit, a surprise audit to see how everybody's doing, we're so proud that the last audit showed that we're, we want to go hunt zero, zero waste. We were 97% zero waste there. So it's people making a conscious effort to do their little part in taking care of Mother Earth. And now we started on January 17th, <laughs> the ban on plastic bags. You know, I remember growing up, never had plastic bags. Yeah, you went to the store and you put them in the, you know, in, in, in the, the paper bag. And yes, I've got to admit, plastic bag became very convenient and for many purposes. But we got to start shifting. Because it is not about us no more. As the kupuna said, our kuliana, whether it is me as a makua or an opio, we got to think seven generations out. So the banning of the plastic bags and thinking like that, yeah, it's going to be crinking over here. But it's about seven generations out. And people got to make hard choices and tough decisions. But we can do it. Good morning to all of you. Thank you, Kaniala, for your remarks earlier, Keenan um, and Wally. Um, you know, I, when I have a bad hair day, and those are usually rare. I love to come to Kanaoka in a New Century Public Charter School where we are this morning. Because, you know, when you talk about the joy of learning and being in a joyful place, if you need a smile on your face, come to visit Betsy and the Almana and the staff here at Kanaoka Um I was born in Hilo and raised in Waimea. I grew up in the land before time. <laughs> and in that land, <laughs> we were indeed sustainable. Um, Parker Ranch really was the foundation and the cornerstone of our community. Um, I grew up in that part of Waimea that today is called the green side. We knew it as the rainy side when I was a kid. It's like that part of Waimea that we lived in, the rain never stopped. It was always very wet. Um, and our family was the odd family. We were one of the few Hawaiian families in our corner of Waimea. We were surrounded by Japanese families, all of whom were farmers. Um, there was the Akuras across the street, the Fukukis, and the Asatos on the Waimea side of us, and to the back were the Oes, the Hori's, the, um, the Kadas, the Hirayamas, and the Masakis. Um, our dad grew pigs and he raised cattle, and everybody else grew head cabbage, head lettuce, and carrots. Um, my brother and I till today are not very fun of vegetables <laughs> because this is how it worked. Our sustainability system was a very, very generous system. Every second week, Mr. Okura would bring us lettuce and it was not two heads of lettuce. It was a case of lettuce. A case of lettuce was 40 pounds, you know. And, and Mr. Hori would bring us carrots. It was not 
10 carats in a bunch. It was a 50 pound bag of carrots. So man, we had vegetables coming out of every pore in our body. <laughs> but you know, the barter and trade was, um, you know, the, the way of life back then. Everybody shared what they had with each other. Um, we had relatives who lived in quite high, so we were fortunate enough, every Sunday was whole whole day down to Kwai High, and we would get fish from my Uncle David, and of course, you know, there was plenty enough fish to share uh, with our neighbors here in Waimea. That was our concept of sustainability. But then, you know, the world changed on us. We gave up the Opelu canoe for uh, a boat with a two diesel engines, um, cash and carry was the big deal uh, for most of us. Um, you went to the store and you paid for what little items you needed. Today, credit cards, uh, you've gone wild with credit cards. Um, but I, 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 I congratulate you uh, on your efforts to help our world. It's sort of like we're going back to the future by going back to the past. And, and in my mind, that's a good thing. Things like fiscal cliff, the economic crash of 2008, I think are blessings in disguise. You know, we finally are back to a situation where we are going to have to go back to much of what we have given up. Um, as Americans. I just wanted to leave some thoughts with you as emerging leaders. You know, for me, my basic guiding principle is to always do what I do with Aloha. Um, and, and, and that I have found has worked very, very well. And I think in the sustainability movement, um, Aloha as a place. Um, leadership principles, I've always believed that it takes a village, all of us working together to serve our lahui, our families, and our communities. We should strive always to bring out the best in the people and the land. Everyone is a leader in his or her own way. We should always nurture the positives, mitigate if not negate the negative. We should always make our passions and our work joyful, be genuine and sincere in all we do. Our actions must always align with our words. We should focus in difficult situations, always on the issue, not the person. Honesty is the only policy. We should try to be gentle and kind, not hurtful, um, in our journeys through life. We should always believe and trust and respect people. And there should always be follow-ups to our commitments and our promises. I normally have Kama Hopkins, who's my aide with me, because I have a tendency sometimes to talk too much. <laughs> and at my age, my brain is not as big as it used to be. My memory is not as powerful as it used to be. So Kama's usually there taking notes. But I, I, I leave you with those thoughts. Um, and I congratulate you on your efforts, and I agree, you are our hope for tomorrow. So mahalo for having us. Aloha. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to Marianne for, for putting this together. And, and then involving our young, how, you know, I feel from Hawaii uh, to be part of the global a global initiative, and I think it's um, 
you know, we're, we're fortunate that you think about the 50th state as part of this. So this is really quite an honor, and um, I have to say thank you to um, the Hawaiian youth who've been uh, inspiring us. And um, when I asked Makana to write an article or essay about her experience with the Youth Summit, I was just so incredibly touched because she is a brilliant writer, but we didn't know that. And so that's what's happening is there's this incredible discovery process that's ongoing and each of these young people has these special gifts, but you're going to get to see a lot of them. I was so Im impressed with the delegation that went to Martha's Vineyards. And I should say all of you, the parents and everyone, should be very proud uh, of the young people uh, uh, that went to Martha's Vineyards and represented you to the highest, and I say to the highest level, that people were amazed and they were going like, wow, this is, they have it together. And amongst our communities, there's a lot of young people that have it together. They just haven't had the opportunity yet. But my grandmother named me Nane, she named a lot of us. Nane in our language means walk in peace. So my grandmother already had a, a plan for me. You know, I just didn't know about it. And as, as we you know, move through, through, through life and stuff, it, it just, uh, I was able to hear the words of one of our greatest leaders in, in, in California uh, and throughout the country his name was Cesar Chavez. Cesar Chavez was a, a farm worker, became the leader of the United Farm Workers, and he always talked about justice, justice for farm workers. And as a 17-year-old, I heard those words, but I, got, I also got lost in the madness. And then when I came back from Vietnam, I started to, to, to really look at what my grandmother was telling me, and to really look at the cultural and the spiritual part of me. And that gave me uh, uh, a sense of who I was. Today, uh, I just wanted to touch briefly on, uh, on one of my mentors, and his name is Harry Belafonte. Because when I'm walking or I'm listening to him, and he talks about Martin Luther King, it's like front row seat, you know? And, and, you, and you hear all these stories that, that, that are never published, and, and if you, I, read it, this book because it's, it's got some incredible thing. And how, also how he's related to, to his islands here. And so, I, you know, when, when we're talking, what, is, what was one of the, the, the things that Martin Luther King told you that uh, as we were, okay, because you know, towards the end, Martin Luther King was talking about, you know, the war's not right and we have to stop this. And we, certain things that he was talking about that, that uh, originally he didn't speak about. And he says, you know, uh, we are about to assimilate into the, the, the American culture. And they had offered Martin Luther King and many civil rights, many things to accept assimilation. And although some things did happen, he, uh, he says, well, well, what do you think? And Martin Luther King says, I wrote, I wrote it down to make sure, he says, um, he says, Harry, I'm afraid that we're, we're uh, assimilated into a burning house. And Harry says, uh, he says, he called me off guard. What do you mean? If we're assimilated into a burning house, what are we to do? He says, well, I think we should all become firemen. <laughs> and he said, it was so simple like that. And reminds me of, of Gandhi and how simple Gandhi was in his answers to people, or the Dalai Lama. I've also had the honor to be on panels with the Dalai Lama and speak to him about peace and how do we move forward, you know, in this. And he always tells me, keep it simple. I said, oh, okay, keep it simple. So how does that all translate to the young people of today, the Trevors, the McConnells, the Hannas, the, all the young people, uh, is that we have to trust, and that's my, my card today is said, trust. 
And so I trust that they will continue the work that many of you here have done in this island and that we've done throughout the world. That the young people, as, as we give them the tools, and as, as Belafonte says, you pass the baton. We pass the baton to them so that they will definitely hold the baton. Because one of the things he's, uh, 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 Harry Belafonte talks about is that during the civil rights, when we passed the baton, the baton fell. Because there was not an infrastructure. There was not this building. There was not this school to be able to pass the tools. And so a lot of young people dropped the baton. Or, or let's say, a lot of the older elders that were passing on the baton. And so that tells me that the cultural and spiritual part of our work it's, it's, it has to be at the forefront. Uh, in the spirit of all uh, uh, our teachers, mentors, uh, I want to say uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to speak here today and to be here. Um, I'd like to share more of our uh, work with you, whatever we can do to, to support. And I trust that the young people will lead us into better health in the community. So, all my relations. Uh, Good morning, everyone. And um, I'm here to share with you a few words of my experience with Guy and just to and also to reflect about reflect about that our life is fragile, that even though we are here for a short period of, period of time, there's something we can do. What we can do is that we can leave the legacy to the people that are here to continue to continue the job we are doing. So we can leave a signal, a symbol that we were here. And I think that's exactly what guys, guy did, and that's why, but that's how you come over our finite, finite human existence. Because we are, our existence is finite, finite. But what we leave here, the writings, our examples, our hard work, will be here forever. So if it's good, or if it's bad, it's off to each one of us. So I think you should feel really proud that he did many positive things. And we are just seeing the results and that's why we are honoring him here today. So I wrote something, just I, I can be talking with you about my experience with Guy for hours. So I wrote something so I can keep it shorter. <laughs> There are some essential things in the life of a human being to consider this one as a full life. Family, friends, joyfulness, sadness, passion, and the, hap and the happiness for what we do to contribute to the society where we live are some examples of these essentialities. Guy Toyama is one of those person that you can tell since the, first, that since the very first moment you met him, that he lived and enjoys the things he did in life. Although I did not spend many time with him, that little time I could spend with him at his side was a first class one. An experience that, trans that transformed my way of seeing the way we should produce energy, that we need to produce energy in a way that do not dehumanize us, dehumanize us, neither take us to the caves era, but harmonize our technological progress with our need to sustain resources and take them into a good dynamic interaction with the environment that's around us so we can ensure our existence as a society in this singular planet.
Obviously, I did not come here today to talk about geothermal energy, solar, or biofuel made, up, made out of corn. Of course not. I came to tell you that in our communities, we are needing people like Guy, that we need people who believe in the power of the youth that is emerging to face and resolve the challenges that shows up. That we need people able to share what they know without pretending having the monopoly of knowledge. That our world, that our world would not be safe with more technologies. That what we really need are role models. Role models that inspire us, that inspire our desire for being very human beings without pretending to humiliate other, the others. That what we need are real people to show us that our greatness does not lie in the cumulus of material wealth or academic knowledge that we might have. Instead, what truly makes us big is our will to make changes and our desire to perpetuate our accomplishments to overcome one of the major, major fears of the humanity, our finite existence. I thank today, I thank today for having the honor of knowing someone like that. I can assure you that he planted on me his seat for the desire to accomplish a better world for everyone. I know that in some years I will be in a position from which I will be able to promote reforms that will, ch that will change the path of my community, and I can guarantee that many of them will be that innovative scientific knowledge that Guy taught me, but also will be present the eagerness for preserve our planet for those ones that are coming after us. Let's plan. Let's plan as Guy did it. I invite each one of you to help organizations like Stone Soup Leadership Institute, Sustainable Hawaii Youth Leadership Initiative, Martha's Vineyard Youth Leadership Initiative, to spread the water, to make all those seeds, all those seeds grow. This is our future. This is our chance. This is our hope. So, it's the moment to take action. It's the moment to leave a legacy is the moment to honor people that were here before us and do something to this make, make this place a better place to live. So, thank you and this might be something that is, might be something real simple because we believe in keeping things real simple. We don't need to do big, big things. But what I can tell is if I am doing this here, or if we are doing this here, it's because we really feel it. Even though I have something written here, I didn't do it for just an, for a commitment that somebody asked me to do. I really believe that we really need to have more people like that. That if unfortunately he is not here with us, the only thing we can do, the only thing we can control, it is, is keep doing what he was doing. It's sharing with the same emotion, with the same excitement, and he showed me all the great things they were doing at Nelha Laboratories. Is seeing that there is hope and that change will be possible and are being possible. So, thank you, Mahalo. I want to thank Marianne 
for the opportunity to Enrica and your and the Toyama family for being able to do this for Guy on behalf of Guy. I actually met Guy many years ago. Actually, <clears throat> I spent quite a bit of my time actually running away from Hawaii. Actually, um, so the third time I came back home to Hawaii, um, I had a chance to meet with Guy. And at the time, we were actually putting together a group of folks to actually bring the technology in industry together. And you know, with the business of life and everything, Guy and I never really got a chance to, I think, connect up. But Guy was the one actually who came to me and said, "Hey." You know, I'm trying to do some things on the Big Island, and we would love to work with you guys on Oahu. And I think one of the lessons when I think about back then was I was pretty young. I'm not to say I'm old now, but, <coughs> but I was I was much younger, and I was being influenced by a lot of people. So part of this is for you guys to hear too, is when you find people that you connect with, and sometimes that connection just happens when you sit next to someone. You know, follow follow your intuition about things and follow through on it. So, so Guy and I never really got to connect to, to I think, more recently. Um, so in October, <coughs> I had an opportunity to come back to the Big Island. And I've been coming back to the Big Island quite a bit. But finally I had a chance <coughs> in October to get together with Guy. And actually we did it on a Saturday. And he said, well, I can't meet you until like 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock because he was running. And so I met him in Nelha. And he took me around to Nelha. And, and I had known, of course, about Nelha the Natural Energy Lab, but never really had a chance to go there. And Guy gave me this incredible tour, right? And I mean, if you know Guy, at th the whole time I kept telling Guy, man, you're like the mayor of Nelha. I mean, you know everything. I was just so amazed and really inspired. And I think that's part of Guy's, that's really part of Guy's gift. And it's something that I think um, for, the, for you guys who are young people, someday you'll be, very quickly, you'll be my age. And you'll be in that position where you, you don't actually realize sometimes that actually a lot of people are watching you and they're following you and they're being inspired by you. And Guy just kind of did it naturally. But he, I think he always, was always very aware of, <clears throat> of how he was influencing people in a very positive way. It's very easy to be a negative leader. And Guy was always this very positive leader. And he really inspired me. And uh, what I noticed is unfortunately a lot of times young people who really do great work sometimes um, never get past a certain age, you know. Um, I don't think Guy, I actually had a couple of friends <clears throat> who also passed away last year too. They are much younger than I am. So, <clears throat> I, I think the, the, the reality is, I don't think Guy thought that last year was gonna be his last year. I don't think my other friends thought it either. The reality is you don't really know how much time you have, right, really. So. I think the message I would say for the young folks is <clears throat> you always have to be making a difference. You don't have to, and which is really great. I mean, you guys are so much, so together. I was, I was really never that together at your age. <laughs> I was such a mess. All I could think about was going surfing and, and having a good time and not studying. And so, so don't, don't do that. Because uh, <laughs> you make it really hard on yourself later on. Because then when I had to go to college, then I was like, oh boy, this is really hard. But, but you guys are so together. But, um, I, th I guess my message to you is, and for all of us, is we, we, we can make a difference all the time. We don't have to actually wait, because in my mind, too, I always thought, well, I have to wait. You know, when I'm actually somebody, then I can make a difference. But the reality is we can make a difference every day. And so for you young guys, I mean, I'm just, I'm just really excited to think about what you will do in your life, in your lives, as you go along and you stay on this path. And that it's really about how you serve your community and how you help people. And I know all of these things may not totally always make sense, because uh, if somebody was saying to this point, I was that age, I would just be like, mm, I don't really get what he's saying. But you will understand it sooner, sooner than I did. It took me quite a while to figure this out. Okay, so you guys are like <coughs> light years ahead of all of us. So, so I'm very excited. Um, I work for a company that does the most advanced research you can think of. There's probably only a handful of companies in the entire country that, do, that does the kind of work that we do. And we require very, very smart, very enlightened uh, people to join us. So when, when you go off and you study and, you, and you, whatever you learn and you bring back to Hawaii and you stay in Hawaii, there are companies and organizations like us that are looking for you. Um, I was telling to Kathy, when, when, whenever I hear about young people who are really talented that go away from Hawaii, I really feel sad because we lose so much of who we are when these people leave, our young people leave. 
So as a company and as an organization and all the people and the networks that I'm part of, our whole, our whole mission is to create that, that future so that um, we can all go forward together and we can stay together as a family. So um, I want to congratulate um, all of you. I wanted to say that we're very honored to actually start this scholarship foundation in Kai Toyama's name. Uh, Rika, and thank you for your family. Uh, I think Guy is making a huge difference. <laughs> I'm at the very end. Uh, un you know, unfortunately, fortunately, at, at Guy's funeral, and um, and very quickly after a couple of meetings with Marianne, it was really clear. Like, here's a lady who's who's just really kicking it really hard, and and kicking it really hard and making things happen. And that's the kind of people um, we love to be associated with. I like to work with, and I always will support. So, thank you very much, and congratulations again, guys. Thank you. <laughs>